Good morning, everybody. Well, good morning here. I'm not sure where you may be in terms of time zones, but good morning and welcome to uh, this session for the Carter School's Fall 2023 Peace Week. Um, for those I don't know, and I actually, when I looked through the registration list, I realized that most of the names were, were folks that weren't familiar to me. So let me introduce myself a little bit so you know um, who I am. And then this is going to be a session that's going to be um, a little bit interactive and you're going to be doing some some talking and engaging with each other as well as um, as well as with me. So um, I'm Julie Rouge. I'm the associate dean at the Carter School, um, but I'm and I'm also an alum of the program. So um, I actually came to the Carter School in the early 2000s. I'd been I'd spent um, several years running, managing small businesses and restaurants, kind of doing conflict resolution all the time um, and came back to graduate school with the intention to get some formal training in conflict resolution, wanted to work in, in international relations or policy. Um, so I did my master's at, at uh, the Carter School at the time. It was called ICAR, the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution, um, and then did uh, my PhD at the same time as I joined the school as part of the, the full-time team. My research areas, kind of big picture, have been around violent extremism, uh, the role of women in violent extremism, terrorism, women as violent actors, uh, and then the role of media in how we think about violence. Um, I've done international work. Uh, I've done um, exchange programs for students from Central Asia, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Um, done work in, in Ukraine prior to the war uh, in dialogue and community building processes, Serbia. Uh, currently, I'm part of a long running project to support uh, emerging leaders in Myanmar uh, uh, with, with conflict resolution training. Um, but I've also done a lot of work here locally in the United States and, and in the Northern Virginia area, particularly helping communities think about the really difficult values-based issues that they're facing. So whether it is uh, police reform processes or looking at how we handle the Confederate legacy items here in Northern Virginia, street names, monuments and markers. Um, I've done uh, work in, in schools in a variety of ways. So. Um, I think it's kind of a, an experience that I think a lot of folks in conflict resolution have of, of having a lot of different interests and a lot of different ways that we make impact. What I wanted to do today, and <clears throat> this session is geared for people who may not have spent a ton of time in the field yet or are thinking about how they want to build their skills in conflict resolution. And, and what I want to do today is talk about how, how we use those skills in some of our everyday ways. So not necessarily the big picture projects like doing an international project where you're working with large scale communities um, or, uh, you know, major programs that are funded in some way by outside entities. But I want to focus a little bit more on how um, training in conflict resolution, in peacemaking, in mediation, and in restorative practices um, can help us in dealing with the day-to-day -day conflicts and help us in supporting people around us and in our communities in dealing with those day-to-day -day conflicts. Um, and and I'm I'm going to start with asking uh, you all in this in smaller groups to kind of talk about some of the conflicts that you um, uh, run across and and are concerned about. We're going to talk about some of the then the roles together, the roles that we might be able to play in addressing those conflicts. Um, and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the the kind of everyday projects that I've been involved in, uh, working with different conflicts in schools, communities, other kinds of places. Um, and then I want to kind of get a sense from you of kind of where your passions might be in terms of um, dealing with conflict in the in your everyday. So if that is okay with you all, I will um, go ahead and kind of get us started. The first thing I actually wanted to do, and and I warned you that this is going to be interactive and the session description said it. So uh, you're going to have a chance to talk a little bit today um, with each other as well. But what I the first thing I want to do is I'm actually going to put you into some breakout rooms. Um, and I want you to in those breakout rooms, just spend a couple minutes um, thinking about what are the kinds of conflicts you encounter in your everyday. So be it in work or school, sometimes in your family, uh, volunteer organizations, worship spaces, religious organizations, in other places. Um, and I don't need to you to come back with a full report out about all the ones that you talked about, but just to come back with a couple examples of conflicts that your group talked about um, in the everyday. So. Um, let me figure out how to move this. Um, I think I've got groups going. So it is just going to be just five minutes, just real quick. Um, and then while you're in there, just, just make sure that you identify somebody who's going to come back and just give an example or two 
that you all talked about, about everyday conflicts that you care about and that you'd like to have the ability to do something about. Um, so let, let me just, I'm going to set this for five minutes real quick. Sorry, I'm trying to do the tech and talk at the same time. Um, it'll give you five minutes and then do a 30 seconds breakout. And um, I'm going to go ahead and get them started now. So your job is just talk to your partners about conflicts in the everyday work, school, family, volunteer organizations, any other place you might find them uh, that you care about um, and where those conflicts happen. I'll see you in five minutes. It's always a good sign when people don't come rushing back. So I recognize that means I might have just scooped you through the time space continuum to, to come back to the room, but thank you. All right, I think we have everybody back. I'm just curious to hear a couple of the conflicts you all might have talked about um, that you might care about. And maybe let me see if the room that had um, Jackson, Maya, and Myung Sung might be able to start by just having somebody talk about one or two of the conflicts you talked about. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Jackson. Awesome, um, thanks. I mean, we briefly talked about, I mean, I briefly talked about um, conflict in my family or mm -hmm. internal conflict whether it be, I don't know, um, social anxiety or um, um, arguing with siblings or parents, yeah. stuff like that, um, yeah. in work, um, dealing with, um, um, well, I work in uh, retail sometimes, <laughs> part-time, and um, we're dealing with customers can sometimes be difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yep. Yeah. I, I know that feeling. That was what I did before I came back for school for, for conflict resolution. Certainly did a lot of that. Cool. Thanks. Anybody else from that group want to chime in? All right, cool. And y'all can also put things in the chat. I'll try to look at both of them at the same time. Um, but if there's something you want to, happy for you to do that. What about the group that was Brandy, Myra, and Nate? Anybody want to just mention one or two of the conflicts you all talked about in your group? We we kind of have a, a range of. Okay, cool. um, I I work in refugee integration, uh, uh -huh. and so and and Myra is from Burma and has uh, works in that space of um, resolving um, uh, you know the cultural differences when people try to integrate from other other cultures um, that sometimes often um, involves women's uh, identity and and rights. Um, where they 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 may see opportunities for more rights here in the United States, but culturally it's not acceptable. And so mm -hmm. there's tension there and figuring out um, how to, how local communities, you know, the stresses that place on local communities to integrate um, newcomers, uh, also lots of opportunities there. And Nate mentioned, um, dynamics in public schools um, have have changed and he's going to be um, doing uh, teaching English in Spain. So uh, looking at the differences there, how public school settings um, are addressing those in, in another um, country versus in the US. So those are, those are the, the um, things we talked about as well as the culture, cultural, religious um, yeah. and political um dynamics are really heightened right now um i think people are um going through some identity um conflicts and crises within their religious communities and political communities as things are heightening and in intensity there yeah no absolutely and i i think um i think you'll have really identified where some of the bigger bigger picture conflicts that may have like, you know, large scale intervention or have, lar have large scale conflicts often come down to kind of everyday interactions, right? Around how how we use those rights, how we deal with integration and cross-cultural integration and what it means to to be new in a community and having to, to learn how to interact. So I like that, that you guys took that kind of big picture, some of the big picture kind of international or cross-border issues, but then they come down to how people do do in there every day. Thanks for sharing that. Um, what about the group that had Kai, uh, Paolo, and Stroya? Anything you want to talk about about the couple conflicts you talked about? 
Okay, so I'm like talking on behalf of my group, um, but one conflict that I um, talked about was um, I'm in an English class here at, at Mason at the Fairfax campus, uh -huh. and Kai and I were talking about like, I guess kind of like in classes, for example, like I'm in an English class right now, and I mean, there's so many different beliefs and like religious beliefs, political beliefs um, that different people believe in. And so in one of my class, in my English class, um, we have to do like peer editing for a paper that we're writing. And someone was talking about like the death penalty, for example, or like just different like beliefs that they have. Um, and then the person editing, for example, like this said paper had a different belief on that. So they were like, it was hard for them to like, I guess like, they had a conflict there where it was like, okay, well, I don't see eye to eye with like the point that you're trying to convey. Um, and then also uh, Stroya, she's from Belgium. She was talking about um, like ethnically in Belgium, there's like a conflict there. I hadn't really heard about it um, so much, but she was talking about there and like with the different people and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Great, thank you. You know, one of the things that I think is absolutely true about um, college campuses is that for a lot of people, it's their first opportunity to experience people who think differently than them. Um, you know, a lot of people come from communities where they, where there's a lot of homogeneity and people, and so you get onto college campus and there's absolutely a lot of that kind of interpersonal working through, needing to understand differences of opinion and sometimes really being challenged by, by some of those differences that show up and and I appreciate the the conflict around language as well. And some of those every day, I, I uh, had an experience similar to that in, in Kharkiv, Ukraine, when we were there between the Russian and the Ukrainian speakers and, and some of the conflicts that were showing up in those kind of day-to-day -day situations. Thanks. Uh, what about the group that's Nick and Dr. Chiangir? Do you want to talk about any of the conflicts you all talked about? Yeah, thank you. We have been sharing some conflicts that we've been witnessing in our families and uh, okay. at work with, with colleagues, you know, and very small scale, maybe you can call it, but uh, actually we, we, we've been conducting some small scale mediation or some, some, yeah. some peace building tactics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, among our colleagues and between son and daughter or between wife and husband, yeah. Uh, same same tactics, not elite uh, not elite diplomatic case, but small micro micro right. peace building peace building tactics. Maybe we have been conducting. The, we we we, are, we we share this uh, micro uh, conflicts uh, within this group. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Absolutely, I think um, a lot of us where we put our conflict resolution skills to work every day is in those in those settings, in our families, in our friendships. So I'm really glad that you you mentioned those and how we how we can put those skills to work. And we're going to come back in a couple minutes to talk a little bit more about the roles that you identified, right? The mediation and peace building roles. So thanks for heading us that direction. Um, what about the group that was Amy, Grace, Mahita, and Sabrina? Do you want to talk at all about the conflicts you all talked about? I could start. Um, Thank you. Yep, for sure. So we got to talk about um, like as everyone else is talking about, like, kind of family, um, family conflicts, but mine was personally in, like, work-related side, because um, cur I'm currently trying to change jobs and everything, so mm -hmm. I was talking to our group about how um, you kind of have to be able to communicate better with teams, especially in an environment that's constantly changing with people and with teams and units and everything, um, so it's, my conflict was basically just, um, communication you know but we yeah. had um, someone else on our team amy who um who said that she had some family conflict like she she had so many kids and um it's harder to communicate with age-wise it's harder to communicate with every um with every every person in your family so that's basically what we had for our group nice thanks mm -hmm. absolutely i think those communication pieces are, are really important and in particular when we're dealing with different age groups I want to um, just talk for a minute about some of the different roles um, that we can play when we're thinking about conflict. And this is a kind of a conglomeration slide of some work by William Urey, who some of you may have heard of, um, but he is is part of the Getting to Yes book that came out of the Harvard uh, Negotiation Project. Um, and then Chris Mitchell, who was a 
longtime faculty member here at the Carter School and some different pieces that they have written um, kind of put together into a slide. So, um, and and what I think is useful about these is that I, I see these roles uh, happening both when we're dealing with international conflict and when we're dealing at the interpersonal and the everyday conflict levels. Um, and, and they're really not about kind of formal titles, though some of them are, but about the kind of roles and intervention that we're doing. So, you know, the first one they talk about is, is teacher or coach. And um, I know many of you are students who are learning conflict resolution, right? And so some of the, the role that that's being played in terms of dealing with conflict is by having people who are helping coach, teach what those skills are, how people can navigate that. Um, and it is certainly absolutely true that as someone who's got some conflict resolution skills and training, that you will in your everyday often interact with people who are looking for some advice, who are looking for support, uh, looking for someone to help them figure out a way forward. Um, so one of the skills and and you know we have some classes on this and and um, there's there's training out there to do it to be formally a coach. But I think a lot of us in the conflict resolution field, one of the significant interventions we do is in that coaching. How do we help people prepare to deal with conflict? What are the skills that they need? How do we help them build those skills? Um, whether that's working in a refugee camp and trying to coach and work with groups there who are trying to advocate on behalf of themselves um, or working in our families and communities. I think that's a really important role. This, one of the second roles they talk about is bridge builder. So thinking about how do we build relationships across lines of conflict? So this role may not be trying to directly deal with the conflict itself. So it may not necessarily be taking it on in some kind of formal way, um, but but this is where a lot of uh, exchange programs or when you think about programs that pe bring people together for dialogues on campus or dialogues in communities, what they're working on is trying to help people understand each other better and build bridges across where we might have lines lines of conflict. Um, in the big picture, you may have uh, you know heard of activities like uh, the peace players or um, uh, seeds of peace programs that bring young adults or young people from different sides of conflict zones and bring them together for sports activities or camps or other kinds of things. So they're not directly trying to take on those conflicts, but they're thinking about how do we how do we make connections between communities across lines of difference. Mediators are a role that folks probably think of, and I think uh, Dr. Chiangir talked about was the the role of mediating in families. But really, a, you know, a mediator is, is um, not making decisions, isn't deciding which direction it should go, but is helping facilitate a conversation between parties to a conflict for them to decide. So, you know, in the, for the mediator role, it's really important that, that the parties to the conflict themselves are coming up with the solutions and determining how they want to resolve that. So, so where the mediator comes in is in helping to, to create the space for the conversation, helping to keep the conversation productive, helping to manage some of the power dynamics there might be between. Um, sometimes it may mean not having people talk to each other directly. So this is certainly true, I think, as a parent myself, when I was working on conflicts between my kids, I might be working with them individually uh, on terms of dealing with that conflict before they actually had a chance to talk with each other. But that mediator role empowers the people in conflict to to come up with their own solutions and work together to find them, but helps create the conditions and the safe space to do that. And there's there's certainly formal mediations, right, that happen in the court system and other places, but there's also a lot of informal mediation that, that we do kind of in our day-to-day. -day. Facilitators um, are, are a broader category in the sense of that mediation in that, that what facilitators are doing in conflict is creating space for a variety of different kinds of conversations. So um, a lot of the work that I do right now here in Northern Virginia with communities and um, in, in neighborhoods is really in facilitating and setting the conditions for people to have conversations in which they can learn from each other. Um, they can come together to make decisions around some of the kind of tough issues that they're dealing with. It's also something that we can do interpersonally, right? Just setting up the stage to, to have a conversation, helping create the ground rules so that participants in a conversation feel safe. Um, when we're in classrooms or other settings, we're facilitating, trying to help people be able to bring out their ideas in ways that, um, that they're able to really uh, express them and be heard by the other party. And we may not necessarily be dealing with a specific conflict. We might be trying to help a group understand each else better, 
Um, in workplaces, we do this a lot. We'll do facilitated conversations, particularly when teams might be struggling or there might be conflict happening among, um, among different members of a team. So facilitation is, again, something that may not inherently be directed at a specific conflict, but it's about how do we hold space? How do we create the space for groups and communities, uh, classrooms, you know, all those kinds of settings to get a chance to really be able to communicate effectively. The arbiters sometimes confused with a mediator, um, but it is a little bit different because in the case of an arbiter, um, an arbiter is actually the one who's going to make the decision on the conflict issues in the end. So think about um, an arbiter as someone who might be something like a judge or an arbitration judge or something. So, so they're they're allowed they're allowing space to hear both sides of the story. Um, in a true arbitration, there's actually some back and forth and really trying to get parties to work it out themselves. But fundamentally, the arbiter in the end run is going to make a decision on on those um, on the issues and kind of who's who's right and who's not. And so um, it's an important role because it can really bring out some of the conflict issues and let parties express themselves um, and is a role that not a lot of us end up in where we have the ability to make the decision in the end. So it's a really kind of specific sort of role. A convener is an interesting role. And, and I find working in a university, it's a really important one because there's the ability to bring people together for a conversation and having the, um, uh, you know, the, the space and the, the stature to invite people to come into a conversation is really important. And um, I think you might see this, you know, in workplace settings and other places where you might have someone who's an ombudsman or you might have someone who is a uh, um, in the uh, employee relations or human resources office who works to bring people together when there's issues that are happening in those workplaces or in that every day. Um, so there's a lot of power in being someone who can bring people together. And you might combine this one with other, other roles too. So you might convene people and then serve as a facilitator or as a mediator, um, but there's a lot of power in being able to bring people together. That healer reconciler role is really working through and, and there's lots of conversations around um, working with trauma and with with as people have gone through conflict, dealing with those trauma. The, the healer and reconciler is focused less on dealing with the immediate to the conflict, but more on working on the relationships and how do we help people either in conflict or after conflict really um, come back together, rebuild, potentially rebuild trust, connection, uh, and rebuild relationship. A witness is an interesting one and, and um, it is it is not necessarily a formal witness, like in a trial, but someone who who is participating in the conflict or um, intervening in the conflict by documenting it. So at the international level, think of things like Human Rights Watch or other organizations that are documenting right um, human rights abuses. But we do this all the time and also, right? You'll in conflict, you might ask someone to to be be on the email train that you're sending back and forth just to be aware of it. Or someone might be um, just 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 aware, and you might ask someone to come to a conversation with you, or can you listen in on this to make sure that that we're okay? One of the things that witnesses also do, though, is by their presence, sometimes they change the the nature of the conflict, right? By recognizing that there's someone outside the conflict who's who's watching and listening, that can actually really change the behaviors of people in conflict. And then the last one is a peacekeeper, and so um, in the international focus, this is usually kind of armed forces who are sitting on a line of division between groups who are keeping them from harming each other. But in our day to day, this is often someone who sees conflict brewing um, and may, you know, get step in between and ask the party just, hey, let's just let's just why don't we come over here and talk for a minute um, and help bring that bring that person back to a place that they can engage productively. Um, we also see this with roles, you know, like law enforcement and other things, right, of people who are playing this kind of peacekeeper role. Um, so there's a variety of ways in which I think these different roles play out. Um, what I want to do is actually, I'm going to have you go back to the breakout rooms you were in just for another five minutes um, and think about what are, as, when the role in the conflicts you were talking about, and some of you are going to be getting added to rooms because you weren't there, but you'll, you'll catch up. But in the conflicts you talked about, what, what roles might someone be taking to try to work through those conflicts? And then what would the skills they would need to be successful? in that role? What do they need to be able to do or know how to do in order to be successful uh, in that role in that conflict? So 
I'm going to start these again just for five minutes um, and then just ask somebody to report out. And for anybody who didn't already have a room, I will I will put you in one and see you all back here in five minutes. So you're focused on what the what the roles are um, that someone might take to deal with the conflicts that you were paying attention to and what the skills are they would need to be able to take those roles. So let me get us started. Well, welcome back. Let's give everybody a chance to get settled for a second. Um, I'm going to kind of go the opposite direction of where I went before and just, you know, give a little update to the group. What were some of the roles you thought about? And and I guess I should have said before that they may also be roles that I hadn't identified. So there might be something that you're, you have identified as a group um, that wasn't kind of in that list. So Amy, Grace, Maida, Sabrina, do you want to talk about any of the roles that you thought would would match up to the conflicts you were thinking about? See if anybody from the group that was Amy, Grace, Mahita, or Sabrina, if you'd be willing to tell us a little bit about what you talked about. Yeah, so um, I can start off. Sure, so, I was, um, thank you. So, I was, uh, we had um, talked about consulting, and um, we felt like it was a very, a, a very open job, you know, um, because consulting kind of becomes part of mediating and arbitrating and negotiating. Yeah. So, um. We were hoping like that, that that kind of field really intrigued us, if that makes sense. No, it totally does. And I think there's ways that um, is, as consultants, you often um, may also use a lot of facilitation skills or the power to convene and think about how do you design processes. So absolutely. So that's kind of a, a conglomeration role of some of the um, some of the other kinds of roles, right? A way in which you professionally can get to use a lot of those different roles to support organizations or people. Cool. Thanks. Um, all right, let's go with the group that was uh, Dr. Chihangir, and then we added somebody who was on their iPad, Nick and Sumin. Could one of you talk a little bit about the roles? Yeah, thank you. We've discussed the roles, possible conflict resolution, very beneficial uh, uh, slide. Uh, and we discussed that, uh, of course, there is some kind of algorithm within peace building uh, efforts, and of it's, and it's important to uh, what phase uh, are you at, what phase uh, phase of conflicts or phase of uh, peace 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 process, uh, according to phases of conflict or peace process. Of course, uh, it changed the roles. What kind of roles do you play or uh, track one or track two or track others uh, can can be taking place in, in, in these efforts? These roles are uh, very, very beneficial and very effective, uh, especially after uh, after after conflicts, after uh, wars, uh, post-conflict process. Uh, at, at post-conflict pro process, these these roles are so effective, yeah. especially third-party intervention process. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. No, and I love that your point was that, that we have to do analysis to understand the conflict that we're looking at to know what kind of role to take. And I think yeah, that that's sure. really important really important because often people like have their favorite intervention strategy, right? Or have their favorite role and they try to use it no matter what conflict they're facing. And, and I think that that can really sometimes get in the way of us being super effective. So, you know, whether it's, um, I think that ability to slide between the roles that we play. So sometimes to be the coach, sometimes to be the mediator, sometimes to be the, you know, the teacher um, is a really important part of our skills. Of being able to use the conflict skills, as well as recognizing when two roles aren't compatible. So if I've been someone who's trying to like arbitrate and I'm making decisions, it's really hard for me to turn around and then say I'm going to be a neutral or uh, uh, an impartial mediator, right? Because I've been in that role. So so it's really important for us to think really critically as reflective practice, practitioners about how we slide in and out of those roles. So I'm really glad that you mentioned the analysis piece of understanding the conflict that we're in. Thanks, that was great, thank you. Um, what about uh, the room that's Avery, Kai, Mary, Paola, Stroya? Can you talk a little bit about the roles that were of interest to you or that you focused on? Uh, 
Um, I can start off, but I forget who who else it was in our group. Um, but I definitely share like the same. Um, I guess you could say like role as them where like you like to be like a mediator for example like inside of your family like okay this person didn't really mean that or just kind of like trying to take a step back and make things not seem as big um or like issues seem as big as they are um because things when people get you know really passionate about certain topics people things can seem like like, yeah well bigger than they are so I guess just being like a mediator I no, I think that's great. And you know, one of the things that I think is true is that a lot of us who have found ourselves in the conflict resolution field found ourselves doing many of those things informally, you know, whether it was growing up or in our workplaces before we decided that that this was a field that we want to get into, that there's a I think a lot of us are just kind of that's an innate place that we go is to think about how do I, how can I be a mediator? How can I work between two people? How can I uh, to help with that. So I think that's a great point that kind of we're, we're in that, that mediator, whether it's official or not. And most of the time it's not official, right? We're not formally sitting down and saying, we're going to host a mediation, um, but we're doing that set of skills and activities a lot in our work between people in our everyday conflict. Thank you so much. Uh, what about the room that was, um, Brandy, Myra, Nate, any of you want to take a, a run at what were some of the roles that were resonating for you? Go ahead, Nate. Um, so we, we talked a bit about um, uh, witnessing um, roles, especially um, like reporting data um, in like refugee um, populations and communities. Um, I talked a bit about that concept as well, like being a, a teacher um, and like looping in administration when working with like a parent, but how we hadn't, I, we hadn't really thought about it being like a formal um, role, but like, thinking about it as a formal and how that can be used to um, soften like a conflict, especially where one party is like very assertive in what they want and how you can use a witness to like um, kind of like, soften that intensity. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we also talked a bit about um, keeping with schools with um, like Loudon um, and some of the discussions about like how LGBTQ um, things are presented in schools and how there's parent um, groups and mediators getting involved to try to um, bridge that gap. And yeah, there's been some positive results with that. Go ahead, Brandy. I had a question about um, just with respect to, maybe you'll bring this out specifically, but I have a specific scenario I just wanted your your take on. Like yeah. with... Um, with the Afghan um, uh, influx of of refugee community um, and women women's rights, um, uh, kind of, I'm becoming exposed to many Afghan women who um, are in tension with their um, with their husbands, um, and yet the husbands have a, a very uh, dominant role um, in their culture and in their homes. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I see it's a needful thing for um, facilitation to happen with the men and like positioning the right person of influence in order mm-hmm. to, um, to, to, um, to make in any kind of inroads or con- yeah. um, impact. So um as an outsider, I know that I can't be the facilitator or the mediator, but, um, but how to, what role would that be in order to um, Mm -hmm. build bridges with the right people who have influence? Yeah. Um, It's a great question. And and part of what I really appreciate about it is that, that you're really taking seriously being a reflective practitioner. And, And part of what that means is that we understand how our own roles and identities fit in or don't you know, into trying to directly work with the conflict. And um, I think one of the things that that I usually do in, in a situation where I know that I'm not the right person is kind of look for those opportunities to team. Um, and I, I think your phrase of the person of influence. And so this might be an area where um, working to connect, great, I'll get you to come in here in just a second, Nick, working to, c- to connect with someone who may be a person of influence in that community with some coaching or some coaching around what would a process look like or to help think about 
a design, something like that, so that you're not in front of it because you wouldn't be the right person, um, but that you would be able to bring some of your knowledge and skill to helping someone who might be the right person uh, help design and run a process. But I see that in the chat, Nick has a has a suggestion. So let me turn it over to you and you can chime in. Hi, thank you. Um, can you hear me good? We can, yep, perfect. All right, fantastic. Um, so um, on that regard, um, I have actually worked with um, Afghan refugees. I'm originally from Iran and I had that experience uh, back in Iran because as you might know, um, there was uh, a wave of Afghan refugees coming to Iran uh, a few decades ago. And uh, we had the same issue. And what and I was also working uh, to some extent in property development, and most of them were um, working in that area. So what we decided to do with a group of people was that, you know, um, because we were like a neighbor country and we shared the same culture to some extent, uh, we were able to talk to them as an outsider, but not as a like a very much outsider or a stranger. We could share some of the things that we thought, okay, this is a good common ground that we can talk about. And we also, uh, you know, Farsi and Dari are two different languages, but they are very much similar as well. So we could speak within the same language. But um, for me personally, what I tried to do was to make uh, the male counterparts understand that you know if you give more role to your wife to your partner not looking not looking at her as a wife uh, as a dominant person but look at it as a partner in life and what can this partner bring to to your union that can help you as well if she can you know um learn a skill learn a trade and help you to make your situation better in this country why not and what are your objections and as it was uh mentioned before analyzing the problem recognizing the problem not the problem but the obstacle first based on that was a very helpful effective step to understand why this person is is thinking like this how can we, uh, you know, uh, try to bypass that obstacle based on any other solutions that we have and then make them understand that if they bypass this obstacle, it's to their own benefit. In many cases, we were able to do so. In many cases, no, they were still very much traditional. We couldn't do anything. But we, we did have cases that people were open to thinking and they thought that, yeah, sure, sure, I think that's gonna work. And those were the cases that we we would focus on to learn from it as well. I don't know to some extent how much I could answer that, but that is what we did uh, back in Iran. Nice, I think that's helpful because it's, it's a combination of roles. There's a little bit of a teacher role, there's kind of a cult helping with a, cultural understanding, as well as it sounds like some coaching that, that went in there and, and using that idea. I think the, the idea of who's, who is near enough, who's near enough to be a familiar person who could, who could lead that is really important in that conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, let me go to, I think the last room to uh, find out what you talked about a little bit for the roles that were resonating with Jackson, Maya, or myung Soon. Anybody from that group want to talk about the roles you all talked about? All right. Well, we will assume that that was a great conversation, but not not ready to share it. Let me. Um. I just thought I would really quickly just just run through some of the ways that I've seen application um, for the work, sometimes formally and sometimes informally, for some of the ways that I've used the skills. And then I just want to open up for for some Q and A to hear some things about what you all are passionate about doing. I think heard a little bit about what Brandy's passionate about, and I'm interested. Uh, for some others and things that you're working on. Um, so this is just, um, I kind of went through and just was thinking about what what are the ways in which I've seen my experience play out or I've been able to use the conflict resolution skills that that um, that I have kind of in my day-to-day. -day. So certainly in the workplace setting, 
um, quite a few facilitated conversations. And um, it is, it's been my experience that often uh, there's a request sometimes from an organization for, for a group or a unit or an office that, that is struggling that might ask someone to come in from the outside, from within their own organization, just to help them lead a conversation that might help them break through what they're struggling with. So, um, you know, here as part of the university, I've worked with uh, different student and faculty groups or uh, worked with, um, done, done facilitated conversations and trainings with different people on campus, but really thinking about how do we in, in, how do we bring in people's conflict? How do we enhance their ability to do conflict in their everyday? Also, a lot of coaching in the workplace. I think both formally, as someone who is a manager or a supervisor, coaching people that work for me, as well as coaching people who are peers or others in how to do conflict. And then certainly in how we do performance evaluation and performance management um, in the workplace, I think there's a lot of conflict resolution component that goes into doing that successfully and communicating really effectively so that people can hear us. Schools are a huge setting right now for a lot of day-to-day -day conflict. And I think, um, Nate, I think you mentioned it in terms of what's happening in Loudoun. Um, I'm, I'm working with a project right now that is looking at how do we help school boards and communities better connect with each other. This is a partnership with the National Association for Community Mediation and, and Living Room Conversations. But what we're doing is trying to coach and work with um, school board members and the school board staff to have them be better prepared to help have conversations with communities um, and better prepared to deal with things when they get a little bit hot. So, you know, this is what's happening all around us right now. And there's so much schools have become uh, the lightning rod for a lot of the cultural conflict that's happening. Um, and so really helping them, whether it's through coaching or helping them run processes, design, things like that, um, in order to do that. Uh, we have peer mediation in schools. So um, I, we have a lot of folks in our field who have conflict resolution skills who help support peer mediation programs, things like that. Um, I'm working with a project right now that um, brings in outside facilitators for uh, IEP meetings. So IEP meetings are in individualized education program meetings. So these are the, the arrangements between schools and families of students who have um, some kind of uh, difference in their learning ability. So um, that, that help figure out what are the additional supports or, or accommodations that can help that child learn best. And they end up being often fairly contentious because parents and schools may not start an agreement around the best way to support that student. Um, and so we've been working both, um, a couple of years ago, we worked with Loudoun County with all of their special educators, um, but working across the state with how do we bring in facilitators into these very small conversations between schools and families to help those be more effective so they come to better outcomes. Um, and, and there's a huge special education community, so it's actually an area that we can have a lot of impact in a lot of people's daily lives through that. Um, I'm also doing some work with some student groups in schools around their own advocacy around the kind of the kind of school communities they want to live in and the kind of issues that they raise and they're concerned about. So using some of the facilitation skills to help um, students learn about and, and, and develop their own advocacy. Um, restorative justice practices, for sure. Our conflict resolution skills show up uh, in schools a lot in, in doing restorative justice. Um, I've also been working a little bit with, with media literacy um, and, and helping people, uh, helping students understand how to use information and how to build information. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, another kind of area that from my own experience, so just kind of here's here's the places that my skills show up is thinking about how do we do, um, how do we effectively have conversations amongst families about what we're gonna do uh, to support family members who are um, older and need additional resources. And so, so using those skills to help those conversations go well and help support family members and others in those conversations. Um, certainly a lot around us, a lot, there's a lot of different um, circumstances in which family systems um, are struggling. And so using those skills in those, in those moments where families struggle, um, and then certainly parenting, I think we use those skills all the time. I mentioned already, um, one of the things that I've been involved in is working with the local Fairfax County Libraries on doing um, media literacy training that's connected with dialogue skills. So creating some training programs for small groups of, of adults on how do we get good information and then how do we talk about it effectively when we don't agree. Um, and this is kind of overtly an attempt in our communities, in our small groups 
deal with some of the polarization that's happening in the world. Um, and then for many of us, and I know for me, when I'm working in volunteer organizations on whatever the topic is, there is a lot of conflict management um, that happens kind of in those in those spaces and having my own skills to be able to help navigate and try to make sure that we keep people who are excited about doing work kind of engaged in it um, because we're not getting overwhelmed by conflict. Somebody mentioned, and I can't remember who it was, but some of the conflict that's happening kind of in worship spaces. So um, in my own uh, faith community, but it also in others, um, there has been uh, over the last several decades, some significant kind of rifts that are happening along ideological lines and com communities who uh, are are grappling with kind of as as the um, as secular society is moving in certain directions when those religious communities do or don't want to. Um, so for me, that's turned into you know helping uh, my own church community do some survey work, doing some uh, facilitated conversation. Um, I've done uh, workshops and training kind of as part of our adult forums in our church on on how to do conflict effectively, um, but really helping the communities that that church community that I'm in think about how they want to manage conflict within them. And then, as I said, kind of that change management in some other places. So I'm going to stop sharing at that point. And I'm, I'm curious, happy to move to Q&A, but I'm also really interested in finding out what are the kinds of everyday conflicts um, that you all are passionate about working on or see yourself working on? Um, what do you need to, what are you thinking about? What, what could you learn to help get those skills? How do we move from being someone who's getting training or, or thinking about getting training in conflict resolution to making impact? So happy to do um, any of those things, Q&A, or hear about what you're, what you're excited and passionate about. And we can either do it in the chat or feel free to raise a hand or unmute. Question or comment? Um, Yes, uh, okay. if I could go first. Um, mine yeah. is really just regarding what I would like to learn, or maybe it's a very practical situation for me is being afraid of conflict. Um, yeah, being a, you know the flight and and fight responses. Right. I think I'm a I'm a flyer. <laughs> the moment I see conflict, I'm thinking I want to go in the opposite direction. So right. Just, I think, getting over the fear of conflict and because what I usually do um, is not talk about it and then things obviously get worse and don't get resolved. So right. Right. Figuring out how to deal with the fear of conflict, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge question because I think a lot of people are um, are, are fearful or or even if not fearful, may not feel confident. In their ability to deal with conflict and so it's easier just to to not engage um and i think you know a lot of that just is is experience and practice so you know partnering or going i i know um when i know that i'm going to be going into a difficult conversation right or i i always still have those butterflies right but but feeling like i i think i have the skills to manage it um and that that comes came over time but a lot of um, working with other people and going with them or observing what they're doing or having an opportunity to try something um, helped me not, it didn't necessarily take away the fear or the anxiety about dealing with conflict, but helped me have some confidence that I was going to have the skills um, to do something about it or to, you know, to navigate it even when I was in it. Are you, are you doing, um, are you in a conflict program right now getting training or, or where are you in that journey? Um, no, not really, not in any okay. particular program. I mean, yeah. that's one of the reasons I was interested in this. Yeah. In this, not now. But yeah, that, that's certainly something I think I need to yeah. get into. Yeah. 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 And there's um one of the things that I think is helpful when when you're at the um, stages of uh, really starting to be c conscious of working on those skills is to look at that there are um, there are some different kinds of techniques or like there's mediation training, for instance, that gives you a set of steps to walk through to deal with conflict, or there's um, right. toolkits that we'll talk about. Here's how to facilitate a meeting or structure something. And when you're first starting, um, the being able to have a tool that kind of walks you through is mm -hmm. super helpful because you're not yet confident in your own skills to design. Um, and then as you get more and more comfortable then you can 
be more flexible or or take designs in different ways. Um, I know for me that that was certainly true, that when I started facilitating, um, I was really very, very structured and, you know, was was kind of making sure that whatever I was starting with was was really well designed and crafted. And that helped me feel confident in doing that. So um, I think there's some resources that um, that are on our web page also, but there's also some other organiz mediation organizations um, uh, that, that have some of those kinds of guides and toolkits that are a place to start. Um, there's also a book that um, that I use that I think is very easy. It's called Difficult Conversations. I don't remember who the authors are right now, and I don't have it next to me to look, but it helped me think through understanding um, kind of, they, they talk about three different levels of conversation, the the what happened conversation, the feelings conversation, and the identity conversation. And I think it was a helpful tool for me in some of the everyday conflicts to be able to figure out what was going on um, and not well, feel so fearful. Read, yeah. Sorry, I've actually read that book. Oh, good. I think when I read it, I, I think I thought of it as theory. I uh -huh. didn't know people actually use these methods in like no more Abs everyday conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because the thing I found, the piece that I found that was really helpful about them, and, and Avery just put another option in there, Crucial Conversations, yeah. which is another similar book. What I appreciated about that was that it helped me understand why conversations or conflicts that I thought were pretty straightforward and easy to solve all of a sudden be were much bigger. And I couldn't just solve it with a technical solution. And so I, I think that that's what's useful about some of those books is they give us a framework to think about what's happening. You know, why is the conversation around dishes in the sink that I'm having? Why did this turn into, you know, a much bigger deal than I was expecting? Um, so that for me is helpful, has been thinking about the different layers that people are engaging in conflict. And that when we hit that identity piece, uh, in that the identity conversation that that that's often a real trigger for conflict that if I am prepared for it that I can deal with better yeah. thanks yeah grace super common for people to just be fearful of conflict and not know quite where to start uh, yeah. thanks for asking the question sure. I'm looking at some of what's going on in the chat uh so we've got some interest in passions and conflicts in the Middle East particularly kind of Persian Gulf countries. Great. So trying to get additional training for that. And thanks, Avery, for sharing uh, crucial conversations in that link. Other, um, other people have things that you're passionate about that you really uh, want to have the skills, the conflict, conflict skills to, to help manage or work on in the world? Um, I guess I'll just share like generally. Yeah. Um, just something that I'm really interested in. Um, well, I'm half Colombian, half Lebanese, Palestinian. Okay. And so I'm really interested in, I guess I come from like a background where like, you know, where like my heritage, like my ethnicity, I guess, like the countries that I come from, like, you know, there's a lot of conflict that has happened there, you know, in Colombia, with like, and I mean, Lebanon and Palestine as well. Um, so I guess just being more informed about all of that and like what I guess I can do now and like the way that I live my life even mm -hmm. and then also just um in the conflict class that I'm in now um you know just seeing like everyone brings something different to the table so I really just want to be more round like well-rounded on different topics on um well I guess a little shout out to Mahita who's in my class and we've talked about this but like I guess learning more about different countries and different like mm -hmm. um political ideas and the beliefs of different people just to be able to have like more empathy and um to be able to be you know educated and hear other points of views like that yeah and there you know one of the things that I became aware of as I was going through um my kind of formal conflict classes was I realized that I that there was so much going on in the world and there were so many different kinds of conflicts happening that I wasn't aware of. And it was really kind of eye-opening for me to just be exposed to, oh, okay, there's there's someone here in my class that's from, you know, this particular region of the world that's experienced conflict in their particular way and to understand more about that. And I think that that's part of what's great about, uh, you know, going through a, a conflict program, you know, in school is you really get that opportunity to do that. 
were you thinking, Paolo, that um, are you interested in working with conflicts kind of around you, or are you really hoping to find a way to kind of deal with those bigger picture international conflicts? Um, that's kind of like the topic that I'm wrestling right now. Okay. So currently I'm studying education. So I might want to work like, for example, in a school and work with, I don't know, kids um, like be an ESOL teacher or something like that. Kids that yeah. come from like a Hispanic background and that are learning Spanish. And then I might want to change to like global affairs and like um, get a minor in Arabic, for example, and work, you know, with relations in the Middle East. So, yeah, I'm not really sure, but that's kind of like the topic that I've been wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is absolutely true is that even when we're working on international issues, usually we're doing it by working with individual groups of people, communities, smaller groups. So we may be trying to, you know, for instance, we were doing the work in Ukraine um, you know, we were trying to work on the larger issue of the tensions between the Russian and Ukrainian speakers in um, northeastern Ukraine, and this was prior to the the Russian invasion in in um, 2022. But uh, but but we were doing that by setting up dialogue processes uh, within a university, and then in that university with the local community, and you know, with some NGOs in that area. So even though we were trying to work on an international issue, kind of a big picture issue. Uh, we were still doing it at the level of working in communities and trying to help those communities build their cohesiveness. So so I don't necessarily think it's an either or, right, in terms of where we use those roles, but thinking about what's the what's the right entry point, kind of going to the point Dr. Chianger did earlier of the, the analysis, right, understanding the conflict to be able to figure out, you know, what's the right intervention point for us to, to bring our skills to it. Cool. Thanks, Paolo. Appreciate that. Any else questions or passions, things that you're really excited about using your conflict resolution skills for or building conflict resolution skills to manage? I'd be interested in learning how, I mean, other than I'm in the master's program as well, and um, how you developed your skills. Other, I'm looking at the course uh, offerings and yep. um, I, other than the facilitation skills and engaging conflict praxis um, mm -hmm. requirements. Um, you know, were there other areas of focus that you um, you did in order to develop those skills that you described? Yeah, I um, I took advantage of a lot of opportunities to do um, volunteer facilitations and things like that. So um, we opportunities over the last couple of years, and I think we're going to have another one coming up to work with. Um, Department of Justice has a, they call it community relations service and they are, they are a response unit for when communities are having particularly racial conflict, not always that, you know, they're in Ferguson and things like that, but they do a cool thing called spirit days uh, in high schools where they actually work with those high school students and they do a full day facilitation to help those students um, identify issues around race or equity that they want to work on in their schools. So, so that's an area that they always reach out to us for volunteer facilitators to go spend the day. And, and I think it's really useful for skill building. You're working with young people, you know, there's a structure to practice, build some confidence um, in doing that um, or kind of local community, like local community groups, things like that. So I, I, I think for me, a lot of it was looking kind of at what was going on around me and where could I um even in small ways, like practice something, you know? So whether it was, okay, let, let's figure out what we could do for a focus group in, in church or um, being invited in to, to lead a, a small group conversation. So um, I, I think there's there's the coursework. So there's a great coaching class also. Um, coaching is a really significant skill. So I really recommend that. Um, the facilitation, uh, you know, we have a mediation class also. Uh, which is kind of learning the the specific mediation skills. So I think there's the coursework component, uh, but then also really taking advantage of both formal and informal opportunities. You know, even in a volunteer organization, being the person that's agreeing to lead the meeting and set up the agenda, and then kind of get a chance to practice trying to 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 get um, to have a really effective meeting run. So they don't always have to be high stakes things, right. Uh, or taking the opportunity to, to, to do a presentation, you know, where you're leading some active group activities. So I, I just really was on the lookout when I was um, going through for all the opportunities I had to, to get out in the world and try to practice things. 
on sometimes unsuspecting people who didn't realize that that was what I was doing. Um, but yeah, I think that combination of looking for the courses that really help you have some specific tools that you can use and then combining that with just taking every opportunity to to get out in the world and give it a try. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, what was the name of the national organization that you were talking about in the Loudoun County area that you're uh, so so we're partnered um, with the National Association for Community Mediation. Um, and uh, they're actually part who we're partnered with right now to do our contemporary dispute resolution certificate. Um, they're a great place. I'm actually super glad you mentioned this. Um, there's community mediation centers all over the country. So there's more than 400 of them in every state in the US and Canada. And they look for volunteers to um, do mediations in the court systems or in local communities. Um, and, and sometimes there's also some paid opportunities. But I would really encourage folks that if you want to be able to get practicing, looking for a local mediation center that um, likely is looking for people that may be volunteers. And they usually, if you're going to volunteer, there's some discounts on trainings and things like that that, that you can do. But they're also a great place to get um, some experience. And, and community mediation centers are cool because they really are embedded in the local community and are really connected with what those community issues are. So they're a great launching point. Um, so I'd really recommend them. So I'm here also, in London and I've got, yeah. um, there's a smaller group called the Venn Diagram group that is um, mm -hmm. worked with focus groups from the two sides of the um, debate, if you will, um, in presenting, um, you know, coming together to build trust in within yeah. those communities and conversation. And, um, and they were able to facilitate, uh, you know, 10, the groups coming up with 10 um, points of agreement that they then presented to the school board. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, you know, the school board wasn't the one that were contracting this group. They just did it in, on their own. So they're, they're, they're going forward with doing similar focus groups. And I've um, asked if I can observe, and then they've invited me to be a parent on the next groups that they're talking about parental um, consent. So, um, but yeah, I would, I was, I'm interested in, in learning and observing, um, more. And so thank you for your tips. Absolutely. And I just put a link, um, to the Piedmont dispute resolution center. They're one of the groups that's working with us on this pilot for school board community, like improving school board community interactions. They're specifically going to do their project in Prince William County, um, uh, because they already were doing restorative justice, uh, in Prince William but um, they're they're a pretty fantastic organization that you might uh, might want to connect to, and they are they they serve both Prince William and Loudon. Um, so I I don't know if they're already connected to the organization that that you are working with, um, but absolutely I think observing um, there's also organizations like Living Room Conversations, um, which is a national level organization, but but does kind of facilitate it has has a what's the word I'm looking for, like a, a structure for how we can do kind of small group facilitated conversations to try to work with uh, polarization. Better Angels is another one. Um, there's some organizations like that that are um, networks of people who want to, you know, work at the small group community level um, with bringing people together around a variety of, of issues. And Brandy, feel free, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, I, I am doing some work in Latin with the schools in the spring, so I'm happy to connect around kind of what, what we're up to. Thank you so much. Yeah. Other comments or passions that folks have? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Um, about the sure. I have a quick question if I may. Okay, so how about how about we go Stroya and then we'll come back to Nick. So Stroya, go ahead and then we'll come right back to you, Nick. Thank you very much. I have a quick question on the healing and reconciliation part. Uh -huh. What additional either training or certifications would you recommend if somebody does have a peace and conflict uh, master's or, or training yeah. already, um, but would like to be, I would say, maybe more qualified or certified to go that yeah. route? Thanks. That's um, Absolutely. So there's a there's a great program at Eastern Mennonite University. It's called the STAR program. And I don't remember exactly what the acronyms start for, but it's um, trauma and resilience, I think, is the last part of it. Um, and what's important about that is that it's 
when we're thinking about healing and reconciliation, um, both in community conflicts and bigger picture conflicts, the, the the trauma piece, both physical and emotional, is something that we have to pay attention to. And so um, I think we have a little bit of stuff that we do on reconciliation, but I think they have a, a pretty robust program um, that they do. I think some summer institutes and, and other things that is focused on um, how do you work with trauma, right, in, in that reconciliation phase. So um, I would definitely recommend them. Um, there's also... Um, at the Carter School, there's the Mary Hoke Center for Reconciliation, which is focused particularly on people who are inside conflicts, who are functioning as reconcilers. Um, they're, they're, it's abbreviated MHCR, um, and uh, they they might also be a resource in terms of some of the research and things that they, they have done. Um, those are the two things I can think of specifically right now in terms of someone who, you know, additional training in reconciliation or healing. Um, but I think both of those would be important. And I just put MHCR's website in the chat if you want to pick that up. And then um, let me see if I can find the the Eastern Mennonite. Uh, I'll put the Eastern Mennonite website in the chat also. Thank you very much. Yeah. Nick, go ahead. You had a, a question or a comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, my question is uh, regarding the um, the Iran Center at the Carter um, School. I, I saw that uh, there is a Center for um, Iran Research and Studies, and I was wondering how that incorporates in, into your PhD program. And as I mentioned, I'm originally from Iran, and uh, the Middle East conflicts, especially with Iran, is an area that I'm very much interested in, and that's why I applied for a PhD program for the next intake. But I was wondering how that center works with the PhD program, if they do actually, and what are the things or points that you can advise me on? Thank you. Sure. Um, so, um, we, we have a center at the Carter School that is the Center for World Religions, Diplomacy, and Conflict Resolution that does a lot of work on the Middle East. Um, we don't specifically have a center uh, focused on Iran, and it makes me wonder if maybe that's at the Carter Center in um, Atlanta. I didn't see it real quickly when I looked, um, which uh, may be the case. And so there is the Carter Center in Atlanta, which is more focused on kind of policy and intervention. Um, so. Uh, I, I'm not specifically familiar with that that center, but that's possible for us for the Center of World Religious Diplomacy Conflict Resolution. Um, you know, the faculty in that center are part of you know faculty advisors for our PhD students. Um, they do um, study abroad programs that go to different kind of post conflict spaces that are focused on conflicts around religion. So um, they do study abroad programs in uh, in Israel, Palestine, in the Balkans. Um, in other places where they're looking at specifically how kind of religious conflict plays out. Um, I don't, can't think of anybody right now at the Carter School that is focused specifically on kind of Iran in general. Um, but I'm also happy if you want to drop me a, a, a an email, I'd be happy to set up time and we can talk individually about kind of how 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 what you want to do matches up with with what we um, can support, you know, in terms of PhD studies. Yes, of course. I will definitely do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Well, I did put my email in the chat. Feel free to connect with me and um, I will, you know, potentially connect you to, to a colleague or other resource if that's appropriate or, or, or find some time to connect on your areas. Thanks for, thanks for being here, being here with us this morning and, and for this part of Peace Week. Um, and I hope that you all have a great rest of your day and a wonderful rest of Peace Week.